Correct. Your Excellencies, Chancellors, with your permission, I now call on His Excellency, the Right Honourable Sir Ninian Stephen, Governor General of the, of the Commonwealth of Australia, to address the audience. <clears throat> your Excellency, my Lord Mayor, Minister and Members of Parliament, Sir Edward Williams, Chancellors and Vice-Chancellors in serried ranks there in front of me, other distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. This occasion is, as Mr. Justin McCrossan has said, unique, and unique in more ways than one. It's unique in Australian academic history because it's the first time that three Australian universities have come together in one degree conferring ceremony. It's unique too, of course, that this ceremony should be held here in the heart of a great world exposition. But both these facts are in truth the product of an underlying uniqueness, the presence of Queensland's universities and their pavilion in World Expo 88. It seems that in the whole history of world expositions, this is the first time anywhere in the world that universities have been direct participants in an international exposition. Now, here at Expo 88, Queensland's universities have created a pavilion of their own, dedicated to the theme of university research, the basis for the age of technology. That they have, in the process, coined a new word in the English language, univations, while it may disturb the purists, will delight the realists. And it's only further proof that the English la language is as innovative as it is increasingly universal. Universal, perhaps, precisely because it is so prone to innovations and univations. The high appropriateness of this university pavilion's theme is of course reflected in the theme of Expo itself, leisure in the age of technology. That age of technology which Expo 88 proclaims is very largely a product of tertiary education. Without the universities of the world and its other tertiary institutions, we'd have little or no technology and certainly little or no widespread leisure. Leisure as we know it was once the exclusive preserve of the few. They enjoyed it precariously, always in fear of the many, who knew no leisure and whose envy of the few was kept within bounds, peasants, revolts and full-scale revolutions aside, only by force and the threat of force. Now, at least in the developed nations of the world, the quest for most is not so much how to gain leisure, but how best it should be employed. And it's heartening that in Australia, it's increasingly in an quite unprecedented way being employed by mature age students in tertiary studies. Here in Australia, the accretion of leisure has been extraordinary. We have in world terms always been a relatively leisured land, yet even in Australia, and even as recently as 70 years ago, within the lifetime of some of us here today, men and women alike worked some 49 hours a week. Now, 70 years on, the statisticians tell us that Australians have gained rather more than 10 additional hours of leisure each week. And yet, with it all, productivity per head has nevertheless increased into the bargain. It's technology that has made possible that new leisure and it's tertiary education that's given us that necessary technology. It's of course to echo a familiar enough theme to say that the growth of technology over the past two centuries has far outstripped any growth in morality, in human understanding, in humanity. And to read the daily news, whether domestic or overseas, gives substance to that theme. This isn't to say that the world we know here in Australia isn't an infinitely more caring, more humane society than was the Australia of 100 years ago, Australia of the 1880s. Although, as the turn of the century approached, 
Australasia as a whole became known as the social laboratory of the world, still age and invalid pensions were then unheard of. There was no widow's pension until the 1920s. The employed long had to fend for themselves. It's striking that until the middle of last century, rather more than one half of our school-aged children received no education at all. And like the relief of poverty itself, medical care for the poor for long depended on charity and was pitiful in its inadequacy. One has only to read of conditions in the long years of the depression of the late 1890s to understand what was then the plight of the poor. By all the material criteria of caring for those in need, we're a much more caring society than ever before. And so too internationally. One example, it would surely have been unthinkable last century for any government to have dispensed many millions in foreign aid. Now with us, it's unthinkable that we should do otherwise. And all this is equally true of many nations overseas. The same picture emerges if other aspects of life are examined. It's enough just to recall that public executions were not only tolerated, but encouraged by authority in Australia in the last century. And the brutal floggings were for long a commonplace of life. And yet, for all that, worldwide, advances in humaneness, in a sense of what's fitting as a minimum for each member of society in a good society, in the recognition of basic human rights in the broader sense of the term, that lags far behind parallel advances in technology. They await societies which will demand systems of governance which will everywhere ensure those rights and that sort of society, both within nations and between nations worldwide. One potent weapon in the armory of advances such as those is, as in the case of advancing technology, education. It's education and not least tertiary education that's already done much to advance us thus far in our concern for human values. If the gap between mankind's conduct towards others of his species and mankind's mastery of technology is to be at all narrowed, universities and not least those of Australia must be allowed to continue to teach more students and in greater depth, not only the sciences and applied sciences but also those disciplines concerned with mankind, with equipping us for worthwhile lives as members of social communities. And I think especially of the humanities and the social sciences generally. Only by that means will we be fully equipped for the extraordinarily difficult task of living in peace and security as free citizens in rational, organized communities, both nationally and internationally that Queensland's universities, while acutely conscious of the needs of advancing technology, are also aware of the need for a well-rounded society is perhaps shown by their choice of at least four of the five of us who've been so signally honored today. No one of us is outwardly at least a gifted technologist. Some of us may even experience occasional difficulty in the intricate task of changing light globes. But my four fellows, if Miss Astley and Miss Wright will allow me to so describe them, have each contributed much to Australian society at the human level. Two of them have, as authors, much enriched our language and our literature. They have held up mirrors to our eyes so that we might more clearly see ourselves and our society and thus gauge our strengths and our witnesses. Self-knowledge is halfway along the path to reformation and it's the precious gift of self-knowledge that they have offered us in poetry and in prose. My two other companions have long served the state in public office. 
each of them in two demanding capacities. Sir Lou Edwards, first as Deputy Premier and Treasurer, and now as Master Architect of this extraordinary international exhibition all around us. Sir Walter Campbell as Judge and Chief Justice, and much else, and now as Governor of Queensland. We five are singularly honoured that the universities of this state should, on this unique occasion, severally <coughs> grant us these high distinctions. Sir Lou is, <coughs> I am sure, especially gratified that after all these years, he at last in truth becomes a doctor in title, even if it be only a doctor of laws. We thank you for these honours and congratulate the universities of Queensland on that spirit of initiative which has, by their pavilion, provided for universities worldwide, Australia-wide at least, a demonstration to the <coughs> wider Australian public of the vitality and essentiality, and I almost said uh, univality, of tertiary education in Australia.